Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 25, Conrad II, Construction of an Empire. Now before we start, I want to just remind you that I've updated the historyofthegermans.com website and you can find separate pages for the Salians and for Conrad II with transcripts, some interesting pictures and maps. Take a look, it's worth it. You can also subscribe on the website and I will email you every time a new episode comes out. Last week we followed Conrad's acquisition of Burgundy and his sometimes brutal pacification of the eastern border. Today we'll cast our eyes south, first to the southeastern corner, made up of Hungary, Croatia, the Duchy of Carinthia and Venice, and then we shall look at core northern Italy, where Conrad will again shift the focus of imperial policy. We'll close with a look at the kingdom of Conrad at the end of his 15-year reign, the redefinition of kingship, the social changes that are now underway, and the acceleration of construction activity that left us with the great cathedrals of Speyer, Worms and Mainz, to name just a few. But let us start in the southeast. This is a place that has some significance to Conrad in so far as his family had traditionally held the Duchy of Carinthia, which often included the March of Verona. Carinthia is more or less the eastern border of the empire against Hungary and Croatia, stretching from Vienna to Trieste. The March of Verona is then the northern Italian bit stretching from Aquileia to Verona, including the Brenner Passes. There's a map on my website where you can see it. The duchy itself had a fairly weak internal structure. In particular, the Babenberger Counts of Austria and the Patriarch of Aquileia were pretty much independent. Equally, the Italian cities in the region began to assert themselves, and then there's Venice, which is a separate case entirely. That may have been the reason the Salian family was never hugely invested in their duchy in the far southeast, so put up little resistance when Henry II took it off them and gave it to a certain Adalbero, member of another aristocratic clan. Even though Carinthia did not matter that much, Conrad still held a grudge against Adalbero and just waited for his chance to take Carinthia off him. That, however, has to wait. For now, Conrad needs Adalbero to deal with another problem. Hungary. We have not talked much about Hungary these last few episodes, so let me put you back up to speed. By 1030, the King of Hungary was still Saint Stephen, who had taken power in 997 and had been baptized probably by Saint Adalbert sometime between 997 and 1000. In 1000, he was crowned king, with a crown sent to him by Pope Sylvester II, the great friend and tutor of Otto III. Stephen must have received permission from Emperor Otto III, which suggests he would have had to accept the emperor as his overlord. However, Hungarian sources deny that vigorously, and should there have been a concept of overlordship by 1030, it was not much use to Conrad. Conflict between Conrad and St. Stephen emerged over the inheritance of Henry II. Stephen had married the sister of Emperor Henry II, which made his son, Emmerich, a theoretical contender for the throne. If he had ambitions for that role, it did not make it into the Chronicles, since he does not feature as a candidate in the election in Camba in 1024. But apart from the imperial crown, Emmerich had a justifiable claim to the Duchy of Bavaria, thereby standing very much in the way of the elevation of Conrad's son Henry to the ducal title. Now whether it was a dispute over the rights to the Bavarian title, or an escalating border skirmish, we do not know. But what is fact is that, Conrad raised a large army to subdue the Hungarians. That effort ended in a total fiasco. Stephen prevailed and even occupied Vienna in 1030. Conrad may have wanted to have another go, but 13-year-old Heinrich, or more accurately his tutor and regent for Bavaria, the Bishop of Freising, signed a peace agreement with Stephen, giving away a large stretch of land to Hungary, something that irritated Conrad a lot. The Hungarian problem largely resolved itself when Emmerich died, causing a crisis over the succession. With Hungary neutralized, Conrad no longer needed the cooperation of Adalbero of Carinthia. Time to grab another duchy for the family. This time the power grab was totally blatant. Rather than waiting for the current incumbent to pass away peacefully, Conrad called a court in Bamberg in 1035 where he made a not further detailed accusation against Adalbero. 
A later chronicler claimed it was high treason because Adalbero encouraged the peace with Hungary in 1031, but that's a slippery slope, since the actual signature on the peace treaty was that of Conrad's beloved son and hope of the empire. It seems a jury of nobles called to adjudicate over Adalbert were also unconvinced by the allegations, and requested to hear young Henry III's perspective. In a terrible blow to Conrad's case, Henry stood up and said that he would not recommend the conviction of Adalbero, since he was bound by oath to support him. Conrad realized that the whole thing had backfired badly, really, really badly. If he would have to let Adalbero go free, the imperial prestige would be seriously dented, which would encourage the magnates to rebel and roll back the centralization efforts of the last few years. Equally, if he would disregard his son's intentions and force the nobles to convict Adalbero, his son's honor would be attacked, and he could have another Ludolf rebellion on his hands. When Conrad heard his son taking Adalbero's side, he berated, backed and threatened him until he fainted with anger. It must have been terrifying for the now 18-year-old Henry to have his six-foot-six father with arms like tree trunks shouting at him at the top of his voice, accusing him of supporting his enemies and bringing shame and disrepute on his reign. But Henry held out. The only thing Conrad had left was to fall on his knees in front of the whole court and beg his son under tears to reconsider. And at that point Henry had to concede. An emperor begging on his knees is a sort of ultimate trump card that is deployed sparingly and only to achieve the most important of objectives. His predecessors had used it too, so for instance Henry II begged on his knees for permission to create the bishopric of Bamberg. As we will see, the salients will have to pull that card a couple more times in increasingly dire situations until it finally stops working. But in 1035, it still worked. Henry relented and the nobles convicted Adalbero of well, being in the way or whatever that Conrad had accused him of. Adalbero was sent into exile where he died four years later. As often in these times, even heavy judgments against the head of a family does not preclude their descendants to return into their previous positions. And that is what will happen here. Adalbero's sons would later regain the Duchy of Corinthia. But that happens later. For now, the Duchy of Corinthia remains vacant for a year, and then Conrad gives it to his cousin, Conrad the Younger. Conrad the Younger had rebelled, but after nearly a decade in the wilderness, he was now considered loyal. Now when Conrad the Younger died, the duchy ultimately went to Henry III, bringing his total tally of duchies to three, plus one kingdom, the Kingdom of Burgundy. But Henry's time is yet to come. Conrad still has one more campaign to run, this time in Italy. If there's one thing we know about Imperial Italy is that it is a mess. Conrad had come to Italy in 1026 and tried to put some structure in. Like in Germany, he tried to broaden the Imperial power base, by complementing the control of the church with closer control over secular lordships. The most important of the latter was that belt across most of northern Italy from Florence to Mantua, controlled by Boniface of Canossa. But Conrad also sponsored other lesser lords. This system looked very successful from the outside. The Italians even contributed an army to support the imperial efforts to acquire Burgundy, something that is a rarity in pretty much the whole of Germano-Italian history. This army consisted in one part of the troops of the secular lords, namely the Markgraf of Canossa. The other part were the troops of the bishops, in particular the troops of Bishop Aribert of Milan. These soldiers are now the problem. To understand where the problem comes from, we need to understand a bit more about the structure of the big Italian cities. In Italy, the big Roman cities had not been abandoned as it happened in Gaul, but remained relevant centers of commerce even throughout the Dark Ages. Importantly, the upper classes remained in the cities, creating an urban aristocracy. As they remained strong, control over the cities did not fall to the bishops merely because they were there, as it happened in north of the Alps. In Italy, the bishops had to fight for it. That fight concluded in the early 10th century, 
when King Hugh of Italy awarded responsibility for the administration of the cities and their surroundings to the bishops, effectively expelling any counts still claiming control. In the fight with the counts, the bishops had to rely on an army of vassals, recruited from the urban aristocracy. These were given fiefs or administrative rights like justice or holding of markets, etc. These upper level of the administration became known as the Capitani, who would in turn have their own vassals, who provided military or administrative services. These sub-vassals were known as Valvasores. The main difference between a Capitani and a Valvasore was that the former would always be able to pass his position down to his offspring, whilst the humble Valvasore would need to be appointed. That meant he could lose his fief. And then below the disunited layer of aristocrats were the urban plebs, who included not just the poor labourers, but also prosperous artisans and rich merchants. The Valvasores were unsurprisingly unhappy about that situation. They did all the work, but had very little security of inheritance and wealth. And that became very obvious when they came back from their glorious fighting in Burgundy. Hoping to be rewarded for their efforts, they instead found little coming down to them. As the chronicler Arnulf reported, Bishop Aribert came to lord it over all, considering his will, not that of others. When, in the summer of 1035, another one of the Valvasores had his benefices removed without much justification, the cauldron boiled over. The Valvasores picked up their weapons and attacked the Capitane and the bishop in his palace. Aribert managed to escape and mobilize an army from other bishops and magnates who were facing similar problems with their Valvasores. The Valvasores in Milan also received help, now from their comrades in other northern Italian cities. The two sides met at a place later called the Campo Malo, the Field of Evil, for all the human gore that irrigated it. The ensuing great slaughter ended only when the Bishop of Asti, a mighty warrior, fell. Aribert, disoriented by the loss of his greatest fighter and the decimation of his army, left the battlefield. Both parties now asked the emperor to come down to mediate. Conrad, with his customary swiftness, collected an army and appeared before Milan in 1036. Conrad took one look at the situation and concluded that the group he cared most about were the Valvasaurus, since they were the actual soldiers Conrad would need on his campaigns. Aribert was understandably unhappy about that, and when the next morning the urban plebs rioted, it's not hard to figure out how that has come about. Conrad had to retreat to Pavia and called Aribert to a royal assembly to defend himself. Aribert showed up, took one look at the jury bench Conrad had assembled to adjudicate him, and went, no comment, and renounced the emperor's jurisdiction. So Conrad had him arrested, and handed him over to the Patriarch of Aquileia for safekeeping. He then put him under the ban, had him deposed and replaced by one of his chaplains. With that move, he managed to turn one small problem into two very large ones. The Milanese, seeing their archbishop locked up and deposed on a pretext, immediately stopped their internal bloody squabbles and united as one. Conrad now had to besiege Milan, the largest and richest city in Italy a city that just 18 months earlier had sent him soldiers to find his private battles for Burgundy. If that was pretty bad, the other problem was even larger. The emperor moving against one of the most eminent bishops in Italy rattled the other bishops who had been the main pillar of imperial power to date. Conrad's actions showed that this emperor relied much more on secular lords and knights than bishops. With their position as de facto rulers of Italy undermined, a number of bishops rebelled. Conrad had them summoned to court as well, where they were convicted of treason and exiled to Germany, presumably pour encourager les autres. The only encouragement that produced was for the Patriarch of Aquileia to release Aribert, who returned to Milan in triumph and began preparing for a siege. Conrad brought his army before the walls of Milan, but struggled to gain any advantage against the well-fortified city, an experience that will become familiar to his successors. In an attempt to break the unified front of defenders, he issued his famous Constitutio de Feudis. 
This was a law declaring that no vassal can lose his fief except through a decision by a court of his peers. All fiefs are inheritable and can even be inherited when the vassal is at war with his overlord, provided adequate compensation is offered. And finally, all vassals are guaranteed not just the fiefs received from their secular lords, but also those received from the church. This is all or even more than what the Valvasaurus were fighting for in the very beginning. The idea seems to have been to break the unity of the defenders of Milan and get the Valvasaurus on side. Several German historians, including Stefan Weinfurter, make this out as a sensible move within a broader context of formalization of the feudal rules and obligations. I'm not so sure. For me, this smacks of desperation. Giving away in particular the church fiefs is the diametrical opposite of previous imperial policy that was meant to be strengthening the bishops and helping them regain the lands occupied by secular lords. This was a steep price to pay, not just in Italy, but also in Germany, where these events did not remain unnoticed. And worst of all, it did not work. Milan did not fall. The Valvasaurus did not flock to Conrad's banner in gratitude. They said, thank you very much, and kept pouring boiling tar on the heads of the German soldiers. When the summer heat set in, Conrad had to retire into the mountains. He did not come back to Milan the next campaign season. Instead, he took his forces down to southern Italy in order to reorganize the Lombard duchies. This looks to me like an effort to create some sort of tangible success out of this otherwise dismal expedition. The impact of his activities was insignificant in the near term, but had one very important long-term effect. Conrad invested the leader of a band of Norman mercenaries with the county of Aversa. Now the Normans had come to southern Italy from about the year 1000. Their journeys tended to be a combination of pilgrimage and mercenary service. Most likely they came in small numbers between 40 and 250 in that first wave, getting involved in the endless fighting between the Byzantines, the Lombard Dukes and the Emir of Sicily. They would play each of these players against the other until 40 years later they will have conquered both southern Italy and Sicily, becoming the key power brokers for the papacy. I am pretty sure I will do a whole episode on Normans in Sicily and the six sons of Tancred of Hauteville, because it is an amazing story. But not yet. Conrad, having organized in inverted commas southern Italy, returned home. He had left it too late, and the army had to march through the heat of summer and, more importantly, through the malaria-infested plains north and south of Rome. Disease struck that killed many, amongst them Gunhilda, the daughter of King Canute, who had married the heir to the throne, Henry. Conrad arrives home at the end of 1038. He orders his Italian vassals to besiege Milan the next spring, even if he would not be there to lead them. He celebrated Pentecost 1039 in Utrecht, where he experienced great pain in the intestines, lies down in bed and dies a few days later. Despite his last unsuccessful Italian expedition, Conrad had left a well-ordered kingdom to his son and heir, Henry III. Henry III had already been crowned king in 1028 and was Duke of Bavaria, Swabia and Carinthia, as well as King of Burgundy. No ruler had yet held such a formidable personal position upon ascension of the throne. And the kingdom was booming. The economy benefited from more efficient agriculture, improving climate and the opening up of trade routes from Italy to England, Poland, Scandinavia and Russia, countries that having long been on the periphery or simply inaccessible. And society changed. Whether that was for good or ill is subject to debate, as is the scale of the change. But that there was significant change I think is undeniable. On the one hand, the creation of the ministeriales created opportunities for serfs to become lords. But on the other hand, lords, both secular and spiritual, became more sophisticated in managing their estates, inventing new obligations their serfs were to deliver. The peasants tried to halt this expansion and sometimes even managed to gain the king's ear. 
So for instance, in 1035, Conrad issued a charter where the abbot of Limburg had to list explicitly all the obligations he expects his unfree peasants to provide, so as to make sure no future abbot requests more than is his due. In principle, peasants were not able to leave their lord's land, but then the rapid development of city populations suggests that at least some made it out. Cities not just in Italy, but also in Germany, were expanding at a rapid pace, some growing fivefold in the span of a hundred years. Conrad was the first ruler who systematically fostered commercial activity by granting rights to markets, coinage, building of bridges and awarding of freedoms. Building techniques improved and the first multi-storey buildings are emerging. Wooden city fortifications are being gradually replaced by stone walls. And the legal position of city dwellers improves. Conrad issued a charter for the city of Speyer, where the children of unfree peoples could become partially free when they lived in the city. The leadership of the city lay in the hands of the bishops ministerialis, themselves also unfree. In the largest of the cities, like Cologne and Regensburg, early forms of communal government were created. We are only 35 years away from the first attempt to expel a bishop from a German city. It is not just the cities where private building activity goes into overdrive. The 11th century is the time when castles spring up all over the place. These are the seats of the aristocrats on the one hand, but also those of the ministerialis, who were given a fief to pay for their service. The greatest buildings of the time are the churches, though. The activity already started with Henry II's grandiose plans for Bamberg and his friend Meinwerk's privately funded building program for Paderborn. But under Conrad and his successors, this is going into overdrive. The cathedrals of Strasbourg, Mainz, Worms, Würzburg, Eichstätt, Hildesheim and Hamburg, to name a few, were completely rebuilt. This renovation drive is the reason we have so few Carolingian churches left in Europe. And in these episcopal cities, the activity is not limited to the cathedral. Whole cities are remodeled in the form of the cross, like Utrecht, Minden and Trier, with secondary churches and abbeys punctuating the endpoints. In Cologne, Constance and Eichstätt, the bishops are attempting to replicate the topography and the holy sites of Rome. Bishops also build sumptuous palaces that are needed to host the emperor. In the 11th century, the empress would stay more and more in the bishops' palaces rather than in their own palaces or Falzen, whilst they were perennially travelling across the realm. Some cities turned gradually into sacral landscapes like the temple cities of ancient Egypt. There was such an attention to detail that, say, Meinwerk would send one of his abbots to Jerusalem to take exact measurements of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre to rebuild it in rainy Paderborn. So who built all this? The Villains, who else? There are stories of bishops driving their peasants to complete exhaustion, neglecting the sowing of crops leading to famine the next year. Bishop Benno of Osnabrück was known for beating up his peasants if they refused to work. I wasn't sure about that comparison to ancient Egypt before, but now it sounds quite plausible, doesn't it? The crowning glory of the salient construction frenzy is undoubtedly the Cathedral of Speyer. Speyer is a modest city of 50,000 inhabitants on the left bank of the Rhine south of Frankfurt, roughly on the level of Heidelberg. It is part of the heartland of the salient family possessions near Worms. Though it had a bishop since 346 AD, at the time of Conrad's accession to the throne, it was a poor bishopric, its churches old and decrepit. It was on the verge of ceasing to be a bishopric at all, and it's also tiny with maybe 500 inhabitants. Conrad, who had seen the splendor his predecessor had lavished on Bamberg, wanted a similar monument to his reign. And Speyer had the great advantage of already being a bishopric, even if it wasn't a very prestigious one. That would save him the hassle of begging his bishops for permission to create a bishopric from scratch. So right from the get-go, Conrad grants Speyer privileges and support. However, other than Bamberg, the bishop himself gets only modest help. All the resources are going into the construction of that enormous church. Even the layout of the city differs from the sacral landscapes actual bishops are building. All roads are aligned to the main facade of the church, a bit like the absolute rulers in the 18th century designed their cities with streets radiating away from their palace. Equally, the design differs considerably from Henry II's dome in Bamberg or Charlemagne's imperial chapel in Aachen. 
These were buildings to be entered from the sides, with all four, or in Aachen's case, eight sides of similar length. There were places for people to congregate and worship together. Speyer is different. It is clearly aligned from west to east. When it will be finished, the main nave will be 134 meters long and 33 meters high, drawing the eye to the elevated eastern choir. In Conrad's design concept, that choir would sit on top of a crypt, whose entrance would be open out to the main nave. So the first thing a visitor would see as his eyes are drawn to the eastern end of the church would be the entrance to the crypt. And that is where the funeral monument of Conrad was to go. It's actually still there, though the crypt has now disappeared under the floor of the cathedral. When Speyer Cathedral was finished in 1101, it was, together with the Abbey Church of Cluny, the largest building in Europe. It still stands today, despite some ill-fated restorations and re-Romanizations in the mid-20th century, but even then, you can sense the immense scale of Salian ambition. And Salian ambition is what we'll hear more about as we go through the next episodes. Next week, we will look at the reign of Henry III, the son of Conrad. In many ways, he's the opposite of his father. He's a well-educated, well-read man, and he will turbocharge the program of church reform emanating from Cluny. But like Conrad, he will expand the power of the monarch, never yielding ground to foreign or domestic adversaries. Let's see how he can manage the resulting tensions with his magnates. I hope you're going to join us again next week. <laughs>